Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Everyone, hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology term podcast. How are you doing? Welcome into the program. Today on the show, we are going to go ahead and do uh, computer headlines. We are going to shy away just a little bit from CES stuff, but inver- invariably, we will not be able to do that. There will still be some CES coverage because we're looking to do CES uh, recaps and stuff like that. And of course, we're going to have a number of companies here doing interviews with us on the program. So to find out all about that and everything that we do, ComputerAmerica.com. That's the best place to go. Definitely recommend that you check that out. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. All right, let's go ahead and start with this first one. And this was catching headlines, um, you know, a couple... Well, yeah, uh, yesterday, I I believe, it was catching headlines. And, yeah, if you didn't catch it, well, this was about a new French law that requires car commercials to tell people to walk or bike instead. And if that sounds a little weird, well, you know, this is, uh, this is just kind of legislation they meant and you know this is very much along the lines of cigarettes or alcohol and how governments and you know you can even take gambling as well where here in the united states where if you have a gambling commercial if you have a a cigarette commercial you have to display prominently that these things cause negative effects well France is taking it a step further, and don't don't worry, they have a uh, you know they have a severe problem with uh, too many cars on the road, not enough people using public transportation, and even though people use a lot of bikes there, they're still trying to promote that kind of lifestyle. In fact, they've even banned cars all around uh, the Eiffel Tower, you know, and of course that central part of uh, of Paris. So France overall is looking to legislate a little bit more. And it will be included in all car advertisement. It doesn't matter if it's print, online, or broadcast radio or TV. And the message must be clearly visible on the screen and or be spoken aloud after the ad proper is finished. So they mentioned that uh, fines for non-compliance can range up to 50,000 euro. Uh, It's part of a wider push to cut down on transport emissions in France, with private cars making up a full 15% of the country's greenhouse gas outputs. The country has already pledged to end the sale of gas and diesel cars by 2040. By the way, if that sounds too soon... Don't worry, California is already going to ban sale of combustion engine cars by 2030. So this is coming fast. Uh, They also mentioned that uh, while the city of Paris has banned older, more polluting vehicles from the city center. Okay, so that's what it is. Uh, Speaking on the legislation, the the Minister for the Ecological Transition of France highlighted that a multi-pronged approach was required to clean up transportation. They mentioned that decarbonizing transport is not just switching to electric vehicles. It means, when possible, using public transit and bicycling. Uh, It's a change that won't directly cut carbon emissions by any means. However, it looks to serve as a way for the French government to push the message that automotive emissions are a negative thing that must be curtailed by multiple means. So essentially... It's bad, they want to let people know, and, you know, it's just one little step, one little push that gets people thinking, yeah, I could drive myself, or I could take public transit. In the U.S., public transit is actually horrible. Uh, It's not really accessible by any means, but in a lot of European countries, it's much better. So, it's an actual viable option. Even if you own a car, maybe consider bicycling or public transit. Now... 
with that being said, we can go ahead and jump into, you know, we'll put all the CES stuff kind of at the end. Uh, this one caught attention, and this is Google. Uh, honestly, like, I don't know how angry I am at this, but a lot of people are, and understandably so. The headline makes it seem really, really bad. Google will pay top executives $1 million each after declining to boost workers' pay. Once again, this is an example of the C-level higher echelon of Google uh, getting lucrative raises where everyday employees of Google are not guaranteed even cost of uh, cost of inflation adjustments. The new executive salaries were disclosed in an SEC filing. The executives receiving the one million base salaries are Chief Financial Officer Ruth Por uh, Porat. Senior Vice President, uh, not even going to try that, and uh, Senior Vice President and uh, Chief Business Officer, and President of Global Affairs and Chief Legal Officer. All four executives are eligible to participate in a maximum $2 million annual bonus program based on contributions to Google's performance against social and environmental goals for 2022. Each person has been granted stock awards and target values in the millions of dollars. The reason why I'm not super upset about this, the lady on the screen that you can see right there, that's her chief financial officer. Uh, her signing package with Google had a lot of benefits that weren't even included in like the number amount, but between the profit sharing, between the bonuses and all that kind of thing, she signed a contract for $70 million dollars that's what she's getting even though her salary is 650 is six hundred and fifty thousand dollars on paper the entire thing was worth about 70 million dollars that's why i'm a little kind of whatever when their base salary goes from 650 to 1 million if anything that is the worst way that these uh individuals would actually want their money they probably don't like this as much as anyone else because they have to straight up pay taxes on that as opposed to stock options, uh, profit sharing, so on and so forth, other ways that they don't have to declare the income, this is going to be taxed much harsher than, I guess, a lot of other income. So even they themselves are like, well, you know, th they like it, but it's not completely necessary. And it doesn't make or break their bank and doesn't make or break Google's bank to raise compensation for four of its employees for like what in the neighborhood of like 1.5 million dollars um don't get me wrong not guaranteeing cost of living adjustments and raises for all their employees google should definitely be doing that uh google has been very financially successful as of late it posted its fifth quarter in a row of record profits but in contrast to giving the four executives huge pay raises the vice president of compensation told workers uh in December, that the company doesn't plan to make broad salary adjustments to account for the rising inflation rate in the United States, which in a lot of cases is 4% or more, if uh, or I think it even hit like 6%, which means if you don't get a 6% raise this year, you are losing money compared to last year. And Google wouldn't even guarantee that. The raises were also given as Google is embroiled in a legal battle over employees who char uh, over employees over charges that were they were illegally fired in 2019. They were part of uh, let's see the employees are planning to call one of the recipients of a new one million dollar salary to testify as an adverse witness. There you go. Um. Yep. There you go. It's uh. It's kind of a double standard, as the article kind of points out here. Executives are getting pay raises. Everyday workers are getting pay cuts. And at the end of the day, I hate to use the phrase, it's not much. You know, for a company that's valued, at, I'm sorry, for a company that is valued at about $2 trillion, uh, $1.5 million is a drop in the bucket. And even for the amount of employees that they have, I think Google's somewhere around the 100,000 range, spread that out. That's like, what, $1.50 for every single person? Like a one-time $1.50 payment? Uh, or maybe $1.50 spread out over a year, you know, because they're going to be paying these people yearly. Their compensation, their compensation packages are egregious. 
you know, 70 million here, 50 million here, 20 million there. Those are what people should be upset about. The one million dollar raises, or you know, and it's two one million, not even one million, but two one million dollar raises. That's kind of a whatever thing. So, if this brings attention to how much executives are getting, uh, are profiting versus everyone else kind of getting, you know, a nothing burger, then hey, more power to them. But it doesn't raise my hackles as much as I think other people will uh, will think. Okay, so that's uh, story number two. Story number three. Let's talk about Activision. And Activision has a big problem with Call of Duty Warzone. It's a free game. Make an account. Make an, you know, if you get banned for cheating, you can make a new account. Cost you nothing, and you're back at it. So their best option, and we've seen Blizzard do this for a number of their games, and Activision does this as well. They are instead suing and unmasking the companies that are selling the cheats to the games. And these can be very lucrative businesses. So the news marks an escalation in the tactics against Call of Duty, and specifically Call of Duty Warzone cheat developers. The company has previously sent legal threats to cheat creators, such as one called CXCheat.net in 2020. This time, Activision has filed a formal complaint against the company in court, and this one is a uh, company called Engine Owning, as well as individuals who allegedly work for the organization. Let's go ahead and do... You know, actually, when you just kind of Google engine owning, which is the company that they filed suit against, uh, it literally says in their description, engine owning undetected cheats for COD, Battlefield, and more. Like, straight up, it's not like, oh, are they selling cheats? Yeah, they're selling cheats. And uh, let's see, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Let's see, so for three days, you get about four euros. For a month, it's about 16 euros. And for three months, it's about 32. Okay, there you go. So relatively affordable. It's a monthly subscription. And hey, they don't like that. Uh, the news marks an escalation, blah, blah, blah. The Call of Duty games are designed to be enjoyed and fared by all. Uh, they have cheat software, such as uh, such conduct uh, disturbs game balance and in many cases leads to non-cheating players to quit matches in frustration. Clearly, I think most people know cheating is detrimental to the enjoyment of the game. Everyone knows that. Uh, they mentioned that the uh, not notwithstanding those efforts, defendants' sale and distribution of the cheating software has caused Activision to suffer massive and irreparable damage to its goodwill and reputation and to lose substantial revenue, which I completely agree. There are people who quit that game every single day because of the number of cheaters who play that game. They mentioned that they are the biggest COD cheat provider of all time. The administrator of a competing Warzone cheat provider called Phantom Overlay uh, told Motherboard, referring to Engine Owning. Uh, Engine Owning offers Warzone, and they mentioned all the prices that we kind of mentioned. The lawsuit says the cheats can include aimbots, which automatically snap cheaters' uh, reticles to enemies, making killing them trivial. Extrasensory perception. Le uh, which lets cheaters look through walls and trigger bots, which automatically fire the weapon for them. So you can think all three of those together. The reticle will track people through walls. As soon as they appear you know, from behind the wall, it will automatically shoot your weapon and stay locked on to the target. Clearly not fun. Uh, the lawsuit names specific people Activision say are involved with engine owning, including Valentine Rick, also known as Skyfail, who is the alleged leader of the organization. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, and they also mentioned that Rick claimed at the time to have sold the cheating uh, developer website to someone else. There you go. Uh, so going through here a little bit more. I mean, hey, it's uh, it's motherboard. They do really well this kind of thing. They mentioned that uh, cheat developers have always targeted Call of Duty franchise, but hacking and cheating seemingly reached new levels of popularity with its free-to-play spin-off Warzone. Uh, they mentioned that uh, anecdotally, cheaters are much less frequent in Warzone after the launch of Ricochet, but the reputational damage against Activision remains. Uh, 
Yeah, in December, workers at Warzone developer Raven walked off the job to protest the treatment of QA team members who were let go from the company. There you go. So essentially, uh, yeah, they say that they were harmed big time by cheaters. And I got to say, from what I've heard about Warzone, like that's what I hear, is man, there are a lot of cheaters, which led them to implement uh led them to implement Ricochet, which was that anti-cheat software that everyone had to install. There you go. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this one. And it, I would love to see if this works. Who knows? But Sweden is going to try it. This coming out yesterday. Uh, actually, this morning. Saying that Sweden launches a psychological defense agency to counter disinformation. There you go. It can be, dis uh, they mentioned that Sweden has created a new government agency dedicated to fighting disinformation, particularly from foreign governments such as Russia, China, and Iran. The Swedish Psychological Defense Agency uh, has an office in Solna, will be headed by Director General uh, Henrik Landerholm, a former ambassador, and will have 45 staff. It will work with academics, the military, and the media, and will offer uh, support to regions, companies, and organizations within the country. The aim, and that's kind of my question, what are they even going to do, is to identify, analyze, and respond to, quote, inappropriate influences, end quote, and other misleading information. So, in the United States, when that happens on Facebook, we don't know until much, much later. And it's only obvious after the fact when you see who's promoting these, uh, you know, who's promoting these topics on like social media, uh, where it's being shared, what groups is it circulating within, and what initiatives we can kind of tie Russian influence campaigns or Chinese influence campaigns in the United States to. It's a very reactive approach it's kind of a look back and see oh that's where we kind of messed up sweden seems to be trying to take it a little bit more or i should say a little faster with i'm sure 45 staff that are going to look at you know kind of broader trends in sweden and say oh this narrative or this story is getting a lot of traction is this legitimate or is this something that is being pushed you know through an agenda uh, they mentioned that psychological defense must also strengthen the population's ability to detect and resist influence campaigns and disinformation. Psychological defense, uh, uh, yeah, so psychological defense contributes to creating resistance and willingness to defend among our population and in our, our end in society as a whole. So their job isn't just to identify, it seems, but also to, yep, identify and. I guess, kind of refute false claims as well. So they mentioned that there was some influence in 2018. They mentioned that around 10% of Swedes are said to read Russian news site Sputnik, commonly described as a propaganda service, which is frequently critical of Sweden's liberal attitudes and is, according to the director, aimed at destabilizing or undermining trust in government agencies, which we've covered this topic before. The Russian government knows that they can pour a little bit of money, pay, you know, a couple dozen or a couple uh, or, you know, somewhere around 100, pay a couple dozen people to spread misinformation, maintain uh, botnets, push narratives that will disrupt and destabilize European countries and the United States because they know that any disruption, any discord, any... Uh, any chaos that they can inflict either to or from like they don't just pick a side and that's it they will pick up both sides of an argument and fan the flames get people riled up you know increase the intensity of any argument from any side and they know that that is so much worth the money you know they could spend just a couple million dollars and they can get way more disruption out of that and a lot of that has to do with you know Take things like, uh, you know, a lot of the propaganda that was circulating about uh, back in tw the 2020 election, when it came to Joe Biden, when it came to President Trump, when it came to uh, one good example 
that we covered was Cambridge Analytica. And there was even a story about how Russia would prefer if Donald Trump had won the presidency over Joe Biden. And that that's a great example because I'm sure that, you know, whether it's true or not, Russia, I'm sure, was backing both sides of that conversation. They were elevating rhetoric like, you know, we can't trust Republicans, it's, you know, so on and so forth. And of course, it's uh, it was fanning the flames on the other side saying, this is a, you know, this is a, de- a Democratic plot and we can't trust the Democrats, this is not true. You know, so I'm sure that they were promoting, this is true, we need to stop it, and this is false, you know, don't believe it. That's the kind of push that Russia is doing all across European countries and America. And it's uh, it's only going to get worse because they see how successful it has gotten. So they mentioned some of the things like uh, disinformation about the virus in Sweden has mirrored the global infodemic, including stories of international spread of a pandemic by foreign actors. Uh, they also mentioned that, quote, the 5G conspiracy theory gained some traction in Sweden and a number of incidents of sabotage antennas have been reported. There's also been a number of disinformation narratives related to the spread of the disease, its actual mortality, and the strategies to avoid getting infected. So you could see that they're aiming at kind of the broader, maybe some of the more obvious disinformation campaigns that you might have heard yourself. So hey, best of luck to them. It's not easy, but I do think that more and more uh, countries need to take this seriously. Not, Not just companies, but countries. Uh, the problem though, is that it's very easy to say that, look, the government doesn't want you to believe this. Therefore, the, you know, we were right. Don't believe it. So, you know, whether or not that's something that, uh, you know, they can even pull off, I'd be curious to see, but there you have it. Okay. So for our next couple of stories, we have three left and... I think they're all from CES, to some extent. Uh, This first one is more about like a broader trend from Google, but I think a lot of people will get behind it. So Google will spend 2022 trying to match Apple's ecosystem integrations. And, you know, we're working on an article behind the scenes about the trends of CES, and I gotta say, this is one of them. Whether it was Samsung, whether it was Sony, whether it was LG, whether it was, you know, any appliance manufacturer, computer manufacturer, smartphone manufacturer, smart uh, internet of things manufacturer, all of them want you in their ecosystem and they want their ecosystem to work with everyone else's. That is the goal. They want appliances working with smart devices, working with the consumer. Because they feel if they can suck you in, they can get you to purchase more and more. And of course, a lot of that goes into the data that they can then collect and habits and lifestyle that people lead. But I digress. Let's talk about Google. They uh, they announced no fewer than 13 different new software features at CES 2022, ranging from AirPods-like fast switching to promised software that will mirror your Android text apps on a Chromebook. It's part of an initiative that Google calls Better Together, but that the rest of the industry is more likely to refer to as catching up to Apple's ecosystem. So the biggest update comes to Google's Fast Pair framework, an Android UI design make, uh, to make Bluetooth pairing headphones easier. Google will extend its, uh, its support to auto switching between devices, faster pairing to Android TV and Google TV, and more. Google will also enable smartwatches to uh, running Wear OS 3 to unlock paired Android phones or Chromebooks, much in the same way that an Apple Watch can unlock an iPhone. There you go. So they're working on that. Uh, Let's see. So they mentioned that all the features Google announced today are planned to arrive later this year. Uh, They mentioned that they will hit Android phones via software updates and even some Windows laptops for Acer and HP. Uh, let's see. So they also mentioned that Google announced plans to bring Google Play games to Windows. It's another sign that the company won't seed Android integration on Windows entirely to Microsoft's software partnership. 
Let's see, so normally at CES, Google has emphasized the power of the Google Assistant. This year, it's hoping that you, uh, uh, it's hoping to get you to believe that Android can work better with your other devices. The challenge for Google is to actually get lots of different devices and manufacturers to support all of these features. That will be no easy task, and it's likely one uh, one of the main reasons why there are no firm dates or even specific hardware production attached to any of the announcements. Honestly, Google does a great job of having an open, customizable platform. You can look at uh, Chromium or any kind of Chrome browser. You can look at Android, which has been developed a hundred different ways. You can look at really a lot of the open source solutions that Google provides and, you know, that Alphabet provides. They, they really do it right. But there's a lot of incentive for companies to not just follow Google and to develop their own solution. So I guess Google's hoping that people pull back from wanting to do it themselves and hey, they hope that they just kind of work with Google's framework. Will it work? Who knows? But we'll find out. The last one should be a quick little announcement. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard. Check this out. Chevy Silverado, the best-selling truck from uh, from uh, Chevy. There we go obviously Chevy Silverado from Chevy. Well, it went electric. They debuted it and they even showed off that, uh, yeah, 2024 is the year that it will come. It will start at $40,000, which is a great price point. I think uh, Ford was also looking to hit that price point as well. And uh, Tesla was aiming for a $45,000, $50,000 price as well. Uh, named, it will be the first off the assembly line in spring 2023 and will sell for a price of $105,000. So these are the fully loaded first editions. Uh, yeah, so that's the base model, and then it will go all the way up to $105,000. Chevy says that after production ramps up, various versions of the truck will be available for fifty dollars to $80,000. And they're making and they're taking reservations for it. You can see the uh, the truck image here looks very nice, uh, very very capable truck. So some of the uh, you know some of the uh, first edition trucks and some of the features that they'll have include four wheel steering, automatic adaptive air suspension enabling the vehicle to be raised or lowered two inches, multi flex mid gate that expands the truck's cargo uh, capability while maintaining seating in the rear row passenger, uh, multi flex tailgate power release, 17 inch LCD infotainment system which you can see right here it looks looks awesome. I really like these larger LCD. Uh, dashboards. They mentioned trailer uh, trailering capable Super Cruise, which is the hands-free driver assisting technology, which should be compatible with about 200 million miles of compatible roads across the U.S. And that's something that a lot of people were wondering because having the trailer really hinders the ability for self-driving to kind of work because you need to be able to see with cameras and have the AI kind of pick things up. But they're somehow managing to make it work and hey, there you go. Um, okay, let's see. So there's that. They mentioned some of these other ones. Uh, they mentioned also things like the the Rivian R1T, the Ford F-150 Lightning, and the Tesla Cybertruck. It's, uh, it's looking like electric pickup trucks are going to be a huge, huge selling point. And by the way, I'm pretty sure they said this thing's going to have a, a, a range of about 400 miles on a full charge with a fast charge of about 100 miles for every 10 minutes of charging. Or at least for the first 10 minutes, you get 100 miles. You know how that goes. So there you go. Uh, mid-2023 mid, mid 2023 is what they're kind of hoping for, but it should be for sale in 2024. If you're looking for an electric pickup truck, just got a lot more interesting. And we'll go ahead and jump right into this last, last one. Sony shows off an electric SUV. You heard that right. Everyone always assumed that Apple would be the next company to unveil an electric car, but Sony, the maker of the PlayStation and televisions and stuff like that, they rolled out their own electric SUV. You can see them here is the Vision, Vision S01, and I think it's also the Vision uh, S02. 
Yes. So they have a sedan and an SUV. And yeah, you can see some of the mock-ups here. They actually had uh, the vehicles there at CES. They rolled them onto the stage. And yeah, so we'll know more later. A lot of these are just kind of mock-ups. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of the features don't completely work, but it was pretty cool to see the maker of you know, a PlayStation actually roll out a full-blown electric car. And trust me, anyone in the entertainment space, I'm talking TV makers, console makers, uh, you know, kind of uh, obviously people like Apple, or I should say companies like Apple, all of them are going to be very interested in bringing you the next space to enjoy your entertainment. They know that the car is going to be the next living space that after self-driving is completely there. Hey, what else are you going to do? You're going to rent movies. You're going to listen to music. You're going to do your shopping. You're going to do everything you do at home in your car. And they want to be the one to bring it to you. So there you go. New Sony cars. You can check them out there. They look fairly standard, I guess. Pretty, uh, pretty generic, but... Hey, again, I'm just surprised that Sony was able to do that at all. So, everyone, the music means that we are about done for the day. I want to thank you so much for tuning into the program. And if you want to find out more about our CES coverage, tune in every day, Monday through Friday, uh, to twitch.tv forward slash computer America. And, of course, check out our website. We have more on that there. Uh, yeah, we have CES recap. We have uh, podcasts and interviews with many companies. Uh, keep an eye on the podcast. That's going to be a big one in the YouTube channel. But we'll also do a recap with Nathan Evans over at Pop Czar with Herman Exum. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. This has been a crazy week, and it, it's only going to get crazier, but it's going to be fun. Everyone, until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.